in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Find at least people, and I don't mean this just as a greeting. I mean this, say this with a sense of, of, of urgency on the inside. Find someone and look them in the eye and say, you, you've got greater courage than you even know. You've got greater courage. You've got greater courage than you even know. You've got greater courage. We've got the patience, and with that patience come courage that comes along. It gets built there in Jesus' name. Greater courage. Some of these things may seem strange to you that we, that we do along the way when we come together, especially on Wednesday night. But we need to, to hear what the Father's heart, heart is, what He wants to do. And oftentimes it's not until we get together that we, we hear it together. It's we're His sheep and we hear His voice and we follow after it. And I say, well, Pastor, I thought you were going to preach a sermon. Um, we, how many of you ever heard sermons before? How many of you have heard five, ten, thousand? Huh? Sometimes it's not another sermon that we need. It's, another, it's, an, it's a doing that we need. It's an application of what we heard and a sensitivity. I always come with a sermon. I, I mean, you know, one preacher said, I, I'll, dr- I'll preach at a drop of the hat, and sometimes I drop the hat, you know, I'm, Always got a sermon that's ready to go. Um, I study to show myself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I always got a sermon ready to go. But we don't always need a sermon. We need a message. What's God want to say and how does he want to say it? And so we need to listening to that and, and flowing with that. And um, it's just like on the illustration on Sunday morning. Um, Sunday morning when, uh, we, uh, and, and with the gifts of the Spirit in operation and and been praying that there would be more of a stirring of the gifts of what God would want to do supernaturally within us. And I um, just sensed in my heart uh, that Amanda, Amanda Jones had something that, that she needed to share. And unknowingly, I just kind of turned around and she was sitting right where Jackie is. And I just kind of looked at her. And she said, yeah. I just nodded her head, yes. And I said, well, come on up. And she came up and she said, well, the funny thing is this. She said, I just thought in my mind, God, I know I have something from you. But I'm not going to give it unless pastor turns around and looks at me. And at that moment, you can't orchestrate that kind of stuff. You can't orchestrate that stuff. And what she had to share, um, there was uh, several people afterwards that came up to her and said, I, I needed exactly what, what you shared. And, and so it's not going to happen that way every time, but that time it did. That time is the way it did. And so it was confirmation to her. It was confirmation then to the people. Um, in, in the service. There were several, again, that was ministered. You see, we don't always know who all got ministered to. They don't always raise up their hand and say, this happened to me. But more and more things are happening. Amen? Amen. And we're going to stir up the gift of God. Right. Well, Pastor, I don't know if I believe in the gifts. Well, then you need to take most of your Bible and throw it out the window. Because everything from the, from the prophets of the Old Testament to the, the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, the, to the, the Apostle Paul and the, and the other apostles... Um, uh, that the signs and wonders and miracles are all the way through there. And so if, 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 if Jesus did it and he said, do the works I did, I think we should do it. And, and so if that's how the church got started, I think that's how the church ought to stay going. Huh? Huh? And, and so, but I'll, but I'll be honest to say, we're, I'm not seeing the signs and wonders that I want to see yet. But we're going to keep on going and believing and, and seeing together the amazing things that God wants to do. Because, because Jesus is a supernatural savior and he is head of a supernatural church. Amen. And in this day and hour, we need to see more of this supernatural moving amongst us. And the power of the Holy Spirit um, working in our lives to what he wants to accomplish and do. And, he, and the Spirit of God will move in different ways. He's starting to move in a different way in me. There's little phrases that people will say that will trigger the voice of the Holy Spirit in my mind. They don't even know it. Just with as someone tonight, even tonight, when someone, I was just talking with them, and they, they said, uh, so-and-so is coming back. And that, and that just, it was just like a, I don't know how else to say it other than, you know, uh, uh, just a, a light bulb just kind of went off on the inside of me. Something about that phrase. Then as we were worshiping the Lord, it was like the Spirit of God said, we need to start calling more people back. And, and for right now, I th- and then I thought, well, that's what the prophet did in the Old Testament. He would call Israel back. You see, the priest represented the people to God. They were with the sacrifices, and they would, priests would go and offer the sacrifice in the Old Testament for the sins of the people, and would go and would represent the people to God. The prophet would represent God to the people. 
he would hear from the voice of God and he would then go and proclaim it. And he would go, especially when the people would start to turn away, God would send a prophet, not a priest. He would send a prophet to call his people back. And in the New Testament, we're prophets and we're kings and priests and have the, the testimony of Jesus and the Revelation says the testimony of Jesus is, is, is prophecy. And so what did Jesus come to do? Call all of humanity back, didn't he? What does the gospel do? Doesn't it call people back to their relationship that what God wants to have and that fellowship that was broken back in Genesis? And so we, the church, we need to start calling people back. Uh, like I said, I'm not into church attendance as much as I am in, into kingdom building and people need to get back into the local church. And it needs to be a spiritual experience that they have in their lives. And so, um, so we call them back prophetically. We call them back with a voice of mis, of, mis, of, of, of mercy. Everyone say mercy. Now, we say mercy. Now, if you say mercy, mercy, mercy. You know, that's a whole different thing. But mercy. We call back with a voice of mercy. As we're compassionate. As people come back. As people come back, we're not saying, well, where you been, what you been doing, and all, da, 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 da. No, we call, man, it's so good to see you come back. I've been praying for you. I've been believing God that you'd come back. I've been staying up late at night, calling into the darkness because, because I've been caring about you. I just want you to know I've been believing God with you and I'm expecting God to do great things in your life. That's something you want to get back into. Amen? So we want to have that, a sense of, of mercy so that we're calling people back to what needs to be done and the things that need to accomplish and the things he wants to fulfill in our lives. So he's a, God, he's a good God and he wants to do good things through us. Amen? And thank you for being a part of, 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 of what God is doing in this day and in this hour. Take your Bible out and it turns to Ephesians, if you would, please. We do have a little bit of a, I uh, uh, still have some time here. And so I want to stir us up Ephesians chapter 4. As we've been reading through the book of Acts. And you've been reading your chapter a day. And if you're new with us, uh, haven't been with us for a little while, um, um, we're glad to have you back. And glad to be back together in the kingdom of God. But what we've been doing this month is we've been reading through the book of Acts, um, a chapter a day, and then through that chapter we'd find a verse that really stuck out to us, and we write that verse down. And at the last day of the month, we're reading all of those verses to, uh, in our lives. And so this is personal discipleship, personal disciplines in our life, reading our Bible. So have you noticed that you've been reading through the book of Acts, how an important unity and harmony is in the book of Acts? It, it, when they were in one accord, it's when there was miracles that would take place. When they were in unity, um, uh, the miracles that would take place. And it's when there was division, is when there would be problems that would take place. And so we uh, want to make sure that we are walking together in unity and in a harmony, not just going the same direction. You can get on the highway out here, it's a one-way street, you know, or down here in Quincy, you get on one of the one-way streets... You might be going the same direction as somebody else, but it's different going the same direction than being in the same vehicle. And a lot of Christians sometimes attend church and we feel like we're kind of going to the same direction to heaven, but God wants us to be working together for the kingdom of God right here, right now, in a sense of unity and harmony where we are coming together with our variety of gifts and, and callings and abilities and we're finding how do we work together to accomplish the kingdom of God? And that there is variety and there is differences within us, but unity is important. Without unity, there will be no power of the Spirit. You can write that one down. Without unity, there is no power of the Spirit. So if we flip that, that statement around, if we want the power of the Spirit, we must have unity. Now, whose responsibility is it for us to have unity? Every one of us. Every single one of us. Not just the pastor, not just a couple of elders, not some paid staff somewhere. It is every single one of our responsibility. When I grew up, when I, when the, around our house was, if you came in the door, shut the door. It wasn't mom's responsibility to shut the door. It wasn't dad's responsibility to shut the door. They paid the bills, but they wanted to teach us to have the responsibility early on to shut the door. And it's so important in our lives that we understand that we need to be, uh, harmony and unity is kept because we all learn to shut the door on the devil. And that we, we see the value of this 
then we see that it is necessity for us to walk together in the supernatural and the power of God in this day and age. Too many times, though, we have forgotten just how important it is. If we'll just stop and think about it. Um, uh, uh, throughout, it was what Satan came to do, was to destroy the unity that we had with the Father in the Garden of Eden. And in that, he destroyed the unity between man and woman. It was the first thing that happened when, when Satan got in there is Adam and Eve got into it, you know? Well, she was the one that did it. Well, the snake was the one that did it, you know? Uh, oh, quick uh, FYI for everybody. Um, um, at this point, we are not planning on going to the rattlesnake roundup, so <laughs> praise God. Uh, praise God for that one. But anyway, um, the unity, it needs to be there. And so Satan came and he tried to bring a, a division, a disharmony, um, dividing man and God. And so then we see Jesus comes onto the earth and he reveals us the importance of the unity. John's gospel, chapter 17, he had that great prayer. Father, I pray that they would be one as we are one. And the power of the unity to work together to accomplish his will. And so God's not interested in church membership. He is interested in a family that is walking together in harmony under the lordship of Jesus Christ along the way. And so we need to see the power of unity. But too often, um, people have, have felt like, I'm not important enough to get involved. I'm just going to kind of ride along, but not going to really get engaged in what is the kingdom of God is doing or what, the, what God wants me to do in the local church. And we feel like, whether it's devouring, de devour, making little of ourselves, or whatever, but the truth is that, that to have harmony and unity in the church, we all must participate together to make it happen. And so it sets an atmosphere and a culture for the Spirit of God to move and manifest Himself. Now, here in, in Ephesians chapter 4, um, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. If this is one of the most um, uh, positive of all the letters that Paul wrote. Um, there's no major problem at the church at Ephesus that he's trying to correct but there's more instruction in what they need to do and just a verification of what the plan of God is. So let's read this, a uh, couple of verses here, and we're going to see how important everyone working together, everyone doing our part, everyone is needed. Everyone is needed. There are no extra parts in the body of Christ. And, there, and so we've got to get that thinking out of our head. Uh, I'm just not that important. I can't, God created you. God has a purpose for you. God redeemed you. God put his Holy Spirit in you. God has graced you in the body for purpose. And we come together to, to, to work together. It's when the Spirit of God is able to work through us and accomplish that. He, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1, Paul says, as a prisoner of the Lord. Paul's writing as a prisoner of God. Now, our prisoner uh, because of the Lord in his life. He's a prisoner here, and he's saying, I, I'm not ashamed to, be a, to have that title. I'm not ashamed that I, I uh, have a record for being in prison um, because of the, the, the hardship that has come into my life because I am following after the Lord Jesus Christ. Vietnamese pastors have said this, we have found that there is something much worse than suffering and persecution. It's disobedience to God. So many times in our lives, we have made decisions by what's most comfortable to us instead of what is the, the will of God for us. We must make sure that obedience to the Lord is what, is what, what makes the decisions in our life. Paul is saying, I've been a prisoner of the Lord, writing from jail, all of these bad things that are happening, but that doesn't bother me. That's okay, because he belonged to the Lord and knew his part. Then he says, I urge you to, to, to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Will you please stop for just a moment and think about this? I don't know how far we might get in our reading here. You can read on you, uh, later on here. Paul's saying, will you, will you, I urge you. I, I, I urge you. There's a deepness here. Will you stop and think for just a few moments? Here we are on Ash Wednesday, and we're starting through a season of, of reflection. And oftentimes we stop and we reflect on, you know, what the Lord's done in my life or how he's guided me here, maybe prevented some things over here, or done some nice, you know, some blessings in our life. And there's, 
That's wonderful. But will you step back a little bit further? Will you stop and reflect back to what God was, had put into place through the apostles, through people like, like Paul here, the, the, the suffering, the, the opposition that they were willing to go through, all of the, the apostles, uh, early apostles, disciples there of Jesus, all of them were martyred except John who was exiled there uh, 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 later on in life. Paul, who had the persecution, everywhere he went, beaten, stoned, shipwrecked. But there was a sense on the inside of them that it didn't matter what it was going to do to affect my flesh. I was going to serve the Lord all the days of my life. I think we've lost a little bit of that, don't you? I think that it needs to be regained in our life. We have come with some silly theology that if God doesn't do everything I ask when I want and how I want, that I'm just not going to serve him. That's, excuse me, but that's ignorant. Uh, it's foolish to, to think that way. When we stop and we think what the Lord has done for us, you know he died for you. You know that he, he paid you for your sin. You know that, that, that he died on a cross for you. You know that he was resurrected for you. You, you know that he now welcomes you and, and now you've been, you've been washed in the blood of the lamb and your sins are all wiped away. And, you, and you, even though the, the enemy says you have a record, you don't have a record anymore with God. And, and you're, you're, you're set free and a child of God. And when, you, when you stop and think about all of that, live a life worthy of your calling. Who you're called now. You now are called. You are called. You're ca you ecclesia. You are called out of the world's way of thinking and living. You've been called out by the, the blood, the redemptive blood of Jesus that has called your name and said, I will forgive you if you will, will just come and accept the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. He's called you not just to exist now that you're saved. He's called you on purpose and with purpose. You have a divine purpose now in your life. It's not selfish. The divine purpose now is where do I now live in such a way that I'm serving the Lord. Now, this is where a lot of preachers like to say you need to get volunteering in the local church. I think you should be involved in your local family church and, and the local church is significant, important. It's, it's, it's what God's using and doing. But I'm, as a pastor, as a pastor, I'm really more concerned on what you do outside of church than I do what you do inside of church. Because if you're not living like you're called outside of church, then you're living like a hypocrite inside the church. Yes. Do you love me? Then serve. Do you love me? Feed, do, do, involve. I want to just to stop for a moment here and just ask us, am I living a life worthy of that? Are you living a life that's worthy of the calling? Called to be a child of God. And then stop and realize, he's not just called me, he's called me with a purpose. Am I living worthy of that? And I don't know what, what, that, some, what that calling is, and whether that calling is feeding the sheep, whether it's called feeding, feeding the lambs, whether that, that calling, and, and, it, and, it, and it starts at some level and it always grows. The problem is that, that too many people want to be in the, on the platform, and you realize before you get to the platform, there's always an altar that you go through first. And, and, and they don't want any kind of form of a personal discomfort just personal performance. And it's supposed to be all about the Lord. My calling is an, a sense of urgency. Am I living worthy? Now he's writing to a good church like Grandview here. Are we living in a way that is worthy of his calling? Listen now, he starts to now kind of break it out and explain it. We've got about three minutes here. Listen, verse two be completely humble and gentle. Thank you, eventually, thank you. Completely humble. Philippians chapter 2, where Paul kind of uh, starts to say about, you know, uh, follow the example that Jesus has given us, who humbled himself and became in the form of a man. That whole little phrase in there actually 
uh, most commentators will tell you that, that Paul wasn't really writing that in a, in a, in, in a, um, a moment there. He was, it was, it was a, a hymn or it was a, a, um, a, a, a chant or, or whatever that, that the early church had that they were sharing with one another that was stirring on the inside of them of who Jesus was and, and the centrality, the centricness of just Jesus there and the example that he was that they would, would, would go over that and would pass that on verbally to one another and spread it around. Humility. It's easy to have harmony when there's humility. It's easy to have harmony where there's humility. You give me a marriage where they're humble and I can give you a home where there's going to be harmony. You give me a marriage where there's someone that's arrogant, egotistical, self-centered, it's difficult to have harmony in that kind of a setting. In our church, folks, we come together, humility. What is humility, basically? It's not devaluing me. It's just valuing you as more important than me. It's not saying that I'm an old, worthless nothing. It's not saying that I can, I'm nothing, I can't do anything, I'm a nobody. No, you're the righteousness of God in Christ. I think that's something. You're a child of Almighty God. I ain't talking bad about you or your daddy. I, I mean, we're... You are somebody, amen? amen. But you, you can be humble about who you are in Christ Jesus and live the, the rest of our life with a sense of not arrogance, but appreciation that I didn't do anything other than receive the free gift that my Father has given to me through the Lord Jesus Christ, completely humble, and then I become gentle in how I treat others. Gentle. Isn't that what Jesus did? It would be so easy for Jesus to come down here and just slap you on the back of your head and say, what in the world do you think you've been doing lately? But in his humility, he sends the Holy Spirit who gently keeps calling us back to where we're supposed to be. That gentle voice, it almost feels like warm honey being poured over us at times. That's that love that, 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 that he ministers to us too and that he wants us to minister to others with. And be patient, bearing one another in love bearing one another in love we're talking about setting an atmosphere for the spirit of God to be able to move where we bear one another in love where we we see shortcomings we see problems you know you get hanging around people very long and 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 not everybody's perfect uh, not everybody is 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 totally Jesus you understand what I'm saying and but we have this love and that we start to instead of segregate ourselves away from them this this love starts to say how can i help that person how can i help that individual what is it that that they need that i can help be a blessing to lighten the burden in their life along the way and that's where harmony comes along if you start to have a heavy load and someone keeps coming along saying let me carry more of that carry more of that that's someone you want to walk with if you're going along with someone and they say, man, you're pretty strong, carry all that. Here, have some of mine too. You, you, do, you don't want to be around a person like that. And so harmony here for the Spirit of God to move is where we come together and we, we bear one another up in love. We care enough about one another to know them. Uh, and there's an atmosphere here where the Spirit of God can move. Listen to verse 3. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. How many efforts? Just one time? We have to continue. Why? Because there is a persistent enemy. And I'll probably just have to close with this. But there's a persistent enemy who is constantly trying to find cracks and crevices that he can, can wedge himself into called the enemy. The accuser of the brethren. He that would try to, to divide. He that would try to, try to, to keep us We've heard it over and over, but it needs to be said. The church will never be defeated from outside. The gates of hell cannot even stand against the church. It's impossible. But if you allow the adversary to get inside, if you allow the enemy to get in and start to, to, to divide and to, to push us apart so that there is a, there's, no, there's no harmony here, then the Spirit of God is very limited in what to do. Because then the only thing the Spirit of God is going to do is, is work on restoration. That's the key that we have to have here. And so he says, everyone, he's writing to everyone in the church at Ephesus, every single one, person just been born again, 
to the, the, to the oldest saint in the room, and he's saying, every one of us must, must do everything we can to keep the unity of the Spirit. Now, he didn't say to keep just peace. He didn't say tolerate anything and put up with everything just so that everybody shows up on Sunday morning. It is the unity of the Spirit. And if we're going to have the unity of the Holy Spirit, then we have unity with the Father in our life also. And that's an atmosphere where heaven can come down on earth and manifest himself amongst us in this place and in our lives. And the world can come and they can see there is something different that goes on here. There is a place. There is really a place that is heaven on earth. There's really a place where God is able to move and people's lives are touched and changed. There really is a place where we're all working together. And as we read on through that, and that's an atmosphere where the Spirit of God then can use the fivefold ministry to equip the saints, if you'll read on, to equip the saints that they might do the work of the ministry. And that circles around, and I will close with this. It basically is paid professionals versus personal testimony. He started off with saying, I urge every one of you to live a life worthy of the calling. That's personal testimony. Your personal life. Your personal testimony, the way you live your life, not the way you go to church, but the way you live your life, should cause unbelievers to question their disbelief in God. The way you live your life when you're not in church should cause unbelievers to question their disbelief in God. And they should say, man, the way Mike Otto lives, man, that, uh, there must be a God. There must be, there must be a God. The, the, way, the way Serena is, there must be a God. Huh? Well, Pastor, I hope you don't call my name. I hope you call, well, if you're saying that right now, I would, this would be a good time to repent and, and, and get things right because we're trying to get people to show up at church to see a professional perform when the Holy Spirit wants to be on the church living their life in such a way that the world is seeing the personal testimony of your life and they're saying, man, there must be a God. I must be wrong. Heavenly Father, Thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit upon us personally. Thank you, Father, for your, for your peace in this place. Thank you that as we come together as a, as a church and, Lord, in our body, that, that there's, we're so diverse and we're thank you for that, Lord. But we come together unto one Lord, one Savior, one God, one faith, one baptism, one, one Lord Jesus. And there's a harmony here for your spirit to move. And you can use us every single one of us in different ways. So Lord, before we ask for an increase in the anointing, we ask, Father, for you to reveal to us how we can live a life that is more, more revealing of the calling that you have in us. That we might live like Christ in this world around us. Every one of us doing our part of just simply following Jesus in such an astounding way that the world starts to doubt their unbelief in God. Holy Spirit, use us, not just in a church service, but use us daily in our lifestyle so that you will be glorified. And God, we're looking forward to the day when we come together and our testimonies are not just about good things that's happened to us, but the person we brought with us is a testimony of the greatness of God and the manifestation of his presence in their lives as they are saved, healed, delivered, filled with your spirit, and their lives are transformed and changed. May we have living testimonies of what you want to do in this day and age. We just pause. Holy Spirit, impress these things deeply on us. Don't let us leave and just 
shrug them off. May they stir us at night when we lay down. May they convict us during the day when we've missed opportunities. May they weigh heavy on our hearts when we have gotten just too busy with life and we realize that our testimony is not at causing anyone to question their, their motives. Use us red daily, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.